Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. That's right, it's summer in The Savage Nation. Of course, it's summer around the world. And I'll be damned if I'm going to talk about the election in 2016. I mean, that to me is the mark of a brain-dead person. I'm sorry. How much can you listen to that rubbish about who's going to run in 2016? Most Americans pay no attention to this until two weeks before the election. So I'm not going to do it. <clears throat> I'm going to do other things right now and talk about the news, views, and reviews. And the most important thing I'm going to do today is announce the winners of the $100,000 scholarship fund because I want to give something back to the world. I want to encourage youngsters who are patriotic, there's so many people like uh, false messiahs out there in the media, including conservative media, that it sickens me. Greedy, selfish people making 65 million a year, owning 18,000 rental units, building beachside mansions and giving not a dime back to society and yet complaining every day about the Clintons making money, about how bad the society is, how horrible America is, laughing all the way to the bank. It, it makes me ill. And rather than talk about the false messiahs, the false prophets. I said, I gotta do something for society other than talk about what's bad. So I put together the um, Savage Scholarship Fund, 20,000 each, not a lot of money compared to Bill Gates, I admit that. But to the students who are gonna receive these scholarships, it's a fortune. It's the difference between going to college and not going to college. So we have the Savage Scholarship Fund, five winners to be announced today. If you want to see the announcement, it's on michaelsavage.com with their names and with their essays, and I'll get to them later. Another piece of housekeeping, the top 25 streaming radio talk shows came out today again, and the editor says, Savage stuns the digital ratings and rankings world, extending his winning streak online and on mobile with massive margins dominating the competition as the number one streaming talk show host with, again, an unprecedented 25 share. Rush Limbaugh, 12.8 share. Laura Ingram, a 6.0 share. Glenn Beck, a 5.6 share. Sean uh, Hannity, 3.7, etc. And some very good people on the list. But apparently the youngsters who listen to me on uh, the stream are tuning into the Savage Nation for whatever the reasons are. So I want to talk about those things. I want to talk about a news story locally. News crew robbed in San Francisco. The camera operator was pistol whipped. While these losers here in San Francisco were covering a murder, which they're covering up because it was a tourist shot in front of a family by an unidentified thug, shot her dead near the ferry terminal. So these ballless news crews go down there to cover the, the, uh, the crime. They get beaten up, their camera robbed, and the idiot with the camera gets hit over the head with a gun, and they don't report what the robber looked like. I swear to God. Even though they were re beaten up and robbed of their cameras, they won't report who did it to them. It shows you what liberalism is, how insane they are. We have no news media in the Bay Area. We have no newspaper. The newspaper is a mimeograph sheet of the uh, Nancy Pelosi, Diane Feinstein, Willie Brown organization. Anything that must, must go through their organizations to be approved. So no pictures of thugs, no crime for the tourists to know about. It's enough to make a sane man cry, but I'm not going to cry. I'm going to continue to do my show. And so I say to you, I'm not ashamed to tell you that song typifies a summer for me. And what I did today was instead of saying, look, I'm not going to hammer them about all the news stories that can make you sick. Many people have turned off talk radio because they, they feel I can't take it anymore. I know what's going on. I know Obama's a crazy pilot who has locked himself into the cabin and he's driving the, uh, the airplane into a, a mountaintop. I get it. We know that there's no opposition party. We hear this every day, Mike. You've done a great job. Now go home. I don't want to hear it anymore. So they've stopped listening to talk radio entirely. As you well know, the ratings are all down across the board. Everyone knows that. It's no secret. It's still a big audience and such, but the, the audience is narrower. 
because people can't listen to this anymore and they can't listen to every day the same story. It's like listening to a song sung by a singer who's singing the same tune like a broken record. So I said, look, I got to do something that's closer to my soul. Yesterday I did a little mysticism, a little Kabbalistic reading on the Savage Nation. Some people heard it, some people didn't. And I was telling you that the, the God's hand is involved in the news anyway. And leave it to God because he is going to punish the bad ones. As sure as I'm sitting here, something good is going to come out of all of it. I don't know what it is. Maybe I'm a Pollyanna. Fine, call me Pollyanna Savage. I don't care. It's summertime. You can call me anything you'd like as long as you spell it right, S-A-V-A-G-E. And then I was studying. I called a neurologist friend of mine when I told him I was interested in the Kabbalah and mysticism again, which I'd studied all of my life. And I never talk about it. He said, do you know that I, tr he, my friend is a neurologist, one of the top in the universe, neuropsychiatrist at that. He said, I actually treated one of the top so-called Kabbalists many years ago. He was a complete fraud. I said, you're kidding me. And I can't mention the man's name. He said he had a huge following, lived in a mansion, had a lot of young women around him, and he died getting fellatio in a swimming pool. I said, oh God, how disgusting. He said, well, that's the way it is. There's a lot of false false prophets out there, and they, they occur even in that world. So be very careful when you enter that world. And, of course, that's the truth. Whatever world you enter, you're going to have false prophets. Be careful of that. So I said, I don't want to talk about any of that today. What I want to do is do a summer show for my loyal listeners. Now, the audience today, Thursday, is probably smaller than most days. It happens before holidays. <clears throat> most normal people are on the road, or they've gone where they're going they change their listening habits and they're not listening to talk radio, which is good because it slows things down a bit and we all need to change our tempo, we need to change our pace. So what I did for you is I went into my, my writing, my, uh, my written archives. I found some uh, very, very short stories that were written. One of, the, one of them is called uh, Newly Over, April 3rd, 1989, written in a North Beach room. And it's three pages long. It has no resemblance to any people living or dead. There is no resemblance to any people who are actually alive. It is fiction. It begins like this. Yellow sheets, handwritten, which has got amazing penmanship, newly over. The winter was nearly over. The winter was newly over. Their little valley radiated that natural magnetism known through eternity, again tossing over whether to move out of there forever, sell the house to Manhattan, refine the excitement of the streets and people, to recapture their East Village youth. No, not so much that, but to reconnect with reactive people, uh, as it was put by Mary, now so pissed at all these non-reactive Bay Area types. So they were talking, they were taking one of their fairly regular walks, and had just come from the back of the valley, where the road ends. The stream was running clear and fast. After months of drought and much talk about water rationing, it had rained, sometimes without stop for days. They were happy in their own way this morning and had agreed not to discuss moving to try to forget the big decision for this perfect spring morning. So a car, an old American gold-colored car, slowly pulls up beside them. The driver rolls down the passenger window and hawks at them. Martin, I see you're enjoying yourself. How you been? He immediately recognized the driver as a neighbor from down the valley who he had remembered from a few years before. Introduced by a mutual friend who had since moved away, Martin and this guy, David, never kept up their friendship, but he remembered him well. In his dark sunglasses, the driver of this old gold Dodge looked like the gangster father he had told Marty about years before. Marty loved to tell the story. See this guy I know. I see him in town once in a while. His father's an old Jewish mob guy in Miami. So one day he's listening to the radio and he hears a talk show guy he knows start to call him a crook, a thief, you know, like that. So his father picks up the phone, calls the station and says, you know who this is? It's Max. And I'll make you a bet. I'll bet I'll be down there in your station in 10 minutes. And he hangs up. Then he hurries out and tells his son, David, then a kid of 13, listen to me, David, don't change the station. Sure enough, about 10 minutes later, the kid hears screaming and yelling in the radio station coming across the speakers, a table, a chair, ashtrays are flying, and he hears his father roar, go ahead, keep up your lies, you know what's in store. So here's this gangster son all mellowing out in a little town years later in Marin County. He leans over and smiles at Martin and Mary, and he says, 
I've just gotten over an eight-week bout with the flu. What's with you? Oh, we're tossing up whether to leave here again, you know, to sell a house and start again. Listen, forget it, says the gangster's son. You're middle-aged. You don't have the energy to move. No one else would want you, so you're stuck together. There ain't no new friends waiting for you because, let's face it, how many people do you like? Martin and Mary turned to each other and laughed. At last, someone who ventured an opinion, and he didn't sound all wrong either. Looking around themselves at the clean, peaceful valley, the busy little mountain birds, the flowering fruit trees with the clear, fast-flowing stream in the background, they both knew a decision had been made for them. They exchanged phone numbers with David and resigned themselves to life as it is, realizing that the many illusory realities of the world would have to hold a meeting and present themselves as a Federal Express offer to get these two ex-New Yorkers off their hillside and moving ever again. And that's the short story called Newly Over on the Savage Nation. Let's hear, let's hear the song again, Robert. Did you guys like it? You guys, you're, you're under 30 crowd. I mean, I am a storyteller, I guess. And so I just told you a story. Right now, I just wanted to give you a little story. And now I want to read something from the margin of these yellow sheets that I found from April 5th, 1989 in that North Beach room where I would go to write. There's a little writing on the side about my writing. It's a commentary on my own writing. And here's what I wrote as my own critic. I wrote, my writing lacks surprise or invention. It's like flying a 747 without incident. It may be reassuring to the crew and passengers, but a story that reads so steady may be a bore. Now, it is true that Japanese brushstroke paintings are not exciting and that I set out to write stories which read as elegant as Japanese brushstroke paintings. See, that's what I wrote. So in those days, I was writing stories trying to approximate Japanese brush brushstroke paintings. And I hope you enjoyed the story painted with a Japanese brush. 855-407-282, Michael Savage to announce winners of a $100,000 scholarship fund. Savage continues domination of talk, radio, streaming. Oh, God, do I have to read the news? Iran violates past nuclear promises on eve of deal. Columbia props paper racial microaggression in everyday life. You take a look at this doll, these psychos. You know, this whole thing about microaggression or white privilege, you know what's written by? People who are so insecure because they know they can't really cut the mustard, as we used to say. They know they can't make the grade, as we used to say. We know they can't fly the plane, as we used to say. These are losers who are using aggression to talk about microaggression and white privilege. What a bunch of rubbish. Can you imagine if idiots like this could penetrate the U.S. Naval Academy? Who would be left to fly the airplanes aboard aircraft carriers? Who the microaggressors who are talking about microaggression? All of these poor, oppressed minorities? What's going to come down to, my friends, is no one will be able to do anything. If you listen to these losers, the Lilliputians, I'll be back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Maybe it's too slow. I don't know. Maybe they want news. Maybe the only one here is Republican, good, Democrat, bad. I'm not voting. I'm going to the Swiss uh, bank account with my 13,000 apartments. Uh, I'm flying on my new Gulfstream complaining about Obama. You know, maybe they want to hear that from the conservative media. <laughs> <laughs> Laughing all the way to the bank. That's a racket, man. The whole thing's a racket. That's why I'm sick of it all. Sick of it all. Give it all away. So anyway, I could do the news. I don't want to do it. So I read a story. Uh, let me ask the audience this. Do you want me to do another story? Do you want me to do news? What do you want me to do? Read, read from my old writings or you want to hear another story from Michael Savage? Something that no one else in the history of radio would dare do or could do? Or do you want me to just, hey, let me get to that news. Hey, do you know what them liberals did today? I want to show you personally. <laughs> that liberalism, I got to tell you. <laughs> I, well, I, I could do a parody of a parody can talk about Muslims get two months in prison for whipping a woman in the face with iron chains. Go look at the picture of the pretty blonde girl beaten up by a thug, a gang of Muslim thugs in Denmark, and see what liberalism is going to bring you. Yeah, go ahead. You want me to talk about Hillary emails? I'd rather bite off my right finger than talk about Benghazi. I swear to God, I'd rather put A1 steak sauce on my hand and bite into my thumb than talk about Benghazi and Hillary emails. That's how I feel, Okay. I don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not required to do it. 
There is a new story. You don't want to hear another story from Buddy? And then Buddy won't do it. If you want Buddy to read another story that he wrote years ago, Buddy will do it. If you don't want Buddy to do it, then don't call and say, Buddy, please do it. It's that simple. One of my favorite comedians when I was young was a guy named Buddy Hackett, who everybody probably forget. I saw him live when I was a little kid up in the Browns Hotel in, in, in the Catskill Mountains. This guy was certifiably a funny guy. <clears throat> so one of his great lines was, he said, I had indigestion my entire life from my mother's cooking. It was so horrible, but I didn't know it was indigestion. He said, so I got drafted into the Army, and they made me go to Fort Dix to sign in. He said, so I go to Fort Dix, and I'm eating the, the Army food, and for the first two days of my life, I, I, I didn't have indigestion, but I didn't know what was wrong, so I went to the Army doctor, and I said, Doc, what's wrong? There's something wrong with my stomach. I don't feel any pain. <laughs> I thought that was one of the funniest things I've heard in my life. I mean, I can relate to that. What do you want me to do? All right, Jerry from WJR has a soul. Jerry, what do you want to hear? Fire away, 20 seconds. Yes, Dr. Savage, I, I'd like to hear some more jazz music and some poetry. And I'm um, getting kind of tired of hearing of ISIS. And there you go. We're all tired of it. We know Obama's playing with, the, with them. We know that they're working for Obama in one way or the other. In other words, if you're not taking them on, then you're enabling them. If you're enabling them, then you're with them. I'll be back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. It's the mood that keeps me alive. I hope it keeps you alive. Welcome back to the Savage Nation storytelling radio program. That's Stan Getz's Desafinado. Anyone out there speak uh, Portuguese? Of course you do. The Brazilian listeners, they may have three Brazilian listeners in the audience. They're all MMA with tattoos on their souls. <laughs> Amazing how different countries specialize in different things, and they all bring something to America except one. One brings death, murder, and hatred. Every other culture brings cuisine, uh, a song in their heart. Only one culture brings hatred and death. Isn't that amazing? Bring in more of them. See what happens. Gene on KCMO, welcome to the Savage Nation. Hi, uh, Ms., uh, Dr. Savage, thank you for taking my call. I just want to tell you to continue doing what you're doing. You're the greatest American patriot we have. I grew up in Queens, New York. I love Summer Plays. That's my favorite song that brings me back to my uh, Far Rockaway High School days. Beautiful. I you see. I came here when I was eight. My father was Russian, my mother was Serbian. My brother was killed in the Marine Corps when he was 25, a pilot and wow. officer. And it saddens me to see what's going on in our country. But uh, you speak for me and millions of other Americans and true immigrants that came here legally. Um, so, Okay, I well, I, I'm sorry for your loss. It's horrible. You lose a, a sibling, you'll never forget it. And I appreciate the kind words you've expressed. I will continue to do... You know, some of the past today, because it is summertime. We all need a break from from Obama and what he's doing to America in plain English. It's that simple. Thank you. And let me send you, by the way, everyone who gets on there gets Countdown to Mecca. Free novel, great book. I'm not going to read from it. I'm not hawking a book today. Leave that to others who need the money. That's all. I'm giving money away now. I'm not looking to sell you a book. Stay on the line. 855-407-282 is the phone number. I'll announce the winners of the $100,000 scholarship fund in the next hour or you can go to michaelsavage.com. The young people who won already know because they were emailed two weeks ago. But if you want to see their names and you didn't and hear from us, it means you didn't win. And I'm sorry, but there were 1,700 applicants, 1,700 essays. Only five were chosen. So let's have a few more calls. Uh, we, we did Gene. KBOI, Logan, welcome to the Savage Nation. What's on your mind, Logan? Dr. Savage, I've been listening to you for years. I love the days when you just stop with the political politics and just tell stories. You know, you're one of the great orators of our times. Your stories captivate us. Uh, it's, that's it's, okay, Logan. That's the truth. The re the regular listeners who know me going back 20 years, or 15 years, or 10 years, know that I do this in the summer. I tend to change the tempo of the show. I get into a more relaxed mode, if you want to call it that. And I like to go into stories because it's, it's only so much you can take and I can take. And yet I, I'm on the radio, so I have a job to do, and that is to keep you listening, keep you entertained, give you hope, whatever it may be. And I can't do it by talking about politics day and night. So, Logan, thank you. I'm sending you Countdown to Mecca, and I'm going to read another story. 
after I take another call. Shelly on WABC in New York City. Shelly, what's on your mind? Go ahead, please. How are you, Mike? Um, I, I like to speak about the golden age of the Catskills. And I remember vividly in the 50s getting into that hack. Uh, they called it the hack. It was a big limo with my parents and five kids. And we packed up everything. We went up to the uh, Pineview Hotel up in Fallsburg. It was in a very exciting, wonderful time. And yeah, I was probably a busboy in the hotel. My family couldn't even afford to go to the hotel. But no, I get it. I That was a golden age for me as well. It's gone, Shelley. It's a piece of history that has gone. How few people le are left who really know what it's about. So at the, at the risk of alienating the rest of the audience, I say thank you. And I will do that uh, at another time. By the way, did you ever have roast pork on garlic bread in like Sheldrake, New York at midnight? What was it called? What are you talking? Well, you're not kosher, are you? You weren't a religious Jew, were you? Totally kosher. I'm a rabbi. Oh, so you didn't have roast pork on garlic bread, but you remember those days. No, we had schmaltz on garlic bread. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> schmaltz is fat. How could Jewish people eat such bad food and live? I don't understand it. Sugar and fat. Anyway, hey, Shelly, stay on because I'm going to do some good stuff today. I'm sending you a copy of my novel, Countdown to Mecca. So let's go right on to, uh, look, Petri, look at people are very depressed. You see, here's another one. Uh, Brendan, DRC Radio, WDRC Radio. Brendan, make your point. Please do so. Hey, Professor Savage. Um, yeah, what's, so, go ahead. Fire away, quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I'm 19. I live in Connecticut. Uh, I'm a college student, and I'm the treasurer of our student government. And, you know, I am so disgusted with this nation at this point in time and the direction that we're going in. I'm a finance major, and it's, just, it's disgusting. I wanted to know... From you, what I have to look forward to, because it seems like I've been robbed of the American dream. You're being robbed by the uh, radical uh, affirmative action cases around you who never belonged on campus. First, they got on campus using affirmative action as a weapon. And then when they got there, they started using phrases such as white privilege and microaggression to steal from you your birthright. Make no mistake about it, you're witnessing a communist revolution under the guise of fairness. And the reason they're getting away with it right now is because the president got where he is on the same game. And so it, this too will change. A pendulum swings, it goes left to right. Right now the pendulum is so far to the left that the clock is almost broken. But I can guarantee you as I sit here, there is going to be a reaction to this maniac. And when this reaction comes, the country will possibly straighten out, as I've said many times on the show. A bird needs two wings to fly, a left wing and a right wing. Right now, the right wing has been tied behind the bird's back, and the bird is in free fall. Stay in the line, my friend. I'm sending you a copy of my novel. You've got a lot to look forward to. Excellence will still, will still win. All of those phonies are going to wind up on the side of the road in the ditch anyway, because that's where they belong to begin with. If they're good, I don't care what their color is, what their sex is, what their sexual orientation is. And remember my one main line, without quality, there can be no equality. Keep repeating that. Without quality, there can be no equality. So don't let the gangsters get you down. So now I want to read another story. I, I, I already got angry. Now the blood is too high for me to even read. The blood went up too high. The energy's too high. The blood's too high. Maybe you can cool me down a little. I don't know what even song to play. Let me go to Kate on WMAL. Kate, go ahead, please. What do you want to hear? Hi. Thank you, Dr. Savage, for taking my call. Um, you play, um, I only have eyes for you, the Shabbat Shabbat song. I would love to hear that. I can't find that any place in the store, but I love Why, why do you love the Shabbat, the Shabbat Shabbat song? I love that song. It has a certain motion to it that's very unique. I played it yesterday. Would you like me? Okay, let's play that, and I'll do the story. Go ahead. You know the one, Shabbat Shabbat. Well, I only have eyes for you. It's an amazing tune. Where is it already? I could read Love by the Sewer Plant, which I wrote during that era. And I uh, <clears throat> don't know if we have the song. We're still waiting. We're improvising here. We are breaking uh, bread together. Why that Republican? Get rid of Boehner. Get rid of Boehner. And that's a Nobel Prize winning statement. Get rid of Boehner. Do that for two hours a day. Freedom. All right, so that sets the, stone, the, 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 uh, sets the stage. The year is 1959. And I found another story in my archives this morning. It's three pages long. It's actually a little scenario for a video. Now that I look at it, I was, it was an outline for something, but it looks like I could do a video on this one. This would be a great little video for me to do. 
get some actors, and it, it bears no resemblance to anyone living or dead. It's pure fiction. It's called The Bungalow Colony. One day in the life of Sammy Berman, year is 1959, scene one, The Oxygen Tent. Scene one, The Oxygen Tent. Doctor to the adolescent. The adolescent boy, as his father lays dying, hovering between life and death in Monticello Hospital. Doctor says, it's like having a blowout in the highway. We put a patch on the hole in the tube, but we don't know if it's going to hold. The father's private parts are exposed in the oxygen tent as his skinny white legs are splayed apart beneath the hospital gown. He lost in a narcotic haze. Scene two, the hotel bar earlier that night. Eight empty glasses in front of him. Sam's father is arm around a hard-faced floozy, singing There Goes My Heart, ordering another two, Ryan Ginger. His wife is there too with all their friends. Just an innocent, drunk night away from the bungalow colony in the neighboring hotel bar. Scene three, in the bungalow, later that night. Sammy is trying to sleep on a cot in the small kitchen of, this, of the family cottage, the one-room bungalow. The father comes in drunk and flashes on the lights. Sammy, stoned on marijuana, sees an image of he himself Sammy, the loyal son, the perennial Untermensch, leaping up, grabbing the large carving knife prized by his mother, carefully put away in its own cardboard sheath, way in the back of the kitchen, and driving the knife into his father's soft chest and back, over and over until the lights are turned back off and the loud man's voice is still. No more gruff commands, no more mocking put-downs, no more mu uh, ugly insults against uh, no more ugly insults thrown at his mother, no more fake biblical wisdom from the atheist whose only fatherly advice to his son about death consisted of a single sentence, quote, God is for fools. When I die, you can throw me in a garbage can. Scene four. <laughs> Robert's laughing. Scene four, the sister. Earlier that day, sitting in the parents' double bed, crying her heart out between tissues, for drying her tears, and towels for dry heaves. The poor 19-year-old is lovesick. She is expecting her boyfriend to visit the bungalow colony for the first time. He is a supposedly a catch, rich, somehow a low-grade mob son. He drives a late-model convertible, a 1958 Chevy Impala. Supporting the sister is her mother, her two aunts, and several family friends uh, placed away from this 10 by 5 room. Now, if this room was put somewhere else, this 10 by 15 room was put somewhere else and set in a spacious, well-appointed drawing room with expensive furniture. The woman, the women caring for this lovesick girl could be characters out of Imperial Russia as painted by Mazursky. The women know about the pain of longing, the hopes, the fears, the in-betweens of blissful kisses, not felt in 20 years. The girl is sobbing now, crying her heart out, muffled by the large bath towel held by mother and aunt to keep the sounds of love-torn grief from the ever-watchful ears of the less close neighbors in a colony without walls. Suddenly, one of the women leaps up and she says, He's here! He's here! I see his car! Scene 5, The Brother Who Never Was. On the dresser sits a few family photos. In the center, on its own doily, is a faded, blurred picture of a boy in a high chair. He wears extra thick eyeglasses and his head is askew hanging almost like a doll whose neck has been snapped by a too playful child. Now join us. I would like music instead of join the Savage Nation. If, if I had the, the perfect situation, we would have gone to some soft music. But savage. Robert didn't know. My, no, no, not the ads. Can, I'll tell you, let me read the end of the story. The automation system is screwed. So, Did you like, Mike, did you like uh, Buddy's story? Did you like Buddy's The Bungalow Colony, The Oxygen Tent? Because that's all you're getting of my soul today. When I come back, uh, we'll go back to the news, I guess. Oh, God, not another. I can't do the news. Look what they're doing to Trump. I don't envy him for telling the truth. Look what they did to me over the years. They try to destroy me. I hope Donald destroys them all. I'd do anything I can to help him. He's right. He's telling the truth. You know that. I'll be back. 
Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Hold on, America. I promise you, I promise you this evil will leave, will leave the country. This evil communist machine that has gripped us by the neck as run by this president of ours, I can guarantee you this communist machine will not win. It will not win. It's been tried in other countries. It's failed in every other country it's been tried in. The unfortunate nightmare we're going through is that most Americans, not you though, you're the, I would say you are the uh, educated Americans in the sense you know what's going on and where they're coming from. It will not work here because we'll run out of, we'll run out of the money necessary to keep this communist machine going. This guy in the White House won't even acknowledge that what he's trying to do here has been tried in Greece, and Greece is now bankrupt. He wants to keep printing the pension money. He wants to keep printing the school money. He wants to keep giving away free education, free food, free phones. We all, him and the old lady fly around the world abusing the privilege of the office. I wouldn't be bad enough as it is if the man was not a double hypocrite of the worst order, telling you to live like a bum, give away everything. He lives like a king. I know how bad it is, believe me. But believe me, God sees what's going on, and I truly have faith that this will turn around. I don't know how, I don't know when. It will be an act of God. Something will happen. And I'm going to take some calls, that's all. Barry on line eight, we have so, so little time. Go ahead, please. Michael, what a pr privilege, privilege it is to talk to you. Uh, one of the things that really scares me right, right now, more than anything else, is... Uh, this uh, maniac in the White House that has never accomplished anything, uh, having Iran uh, setting up to make nuclear weapons and causing the rest of the area to go nuclear, I think this is the scariest thing in my lifetime. I agree with you. Saudi Arabia knows it. Egypt knows it. Jordan knows it. He is against these relatively moderate Arab nations. He is on the side of the most radical Muslim nation on the planet Iran. He is not fighting ISIS because ISIS is his factotum army, for God's sakes. What has to happen for you people to understand why he will not let these countries bring in heavy weapons to the Kurds? Why won't he let heavy weapons go to the Kurds to fight ISIS? Because ISIS is fighting for the sorority. Israel, by the way, is also not attacking ISIS. Because they want ISIS to topple Assad. You haven't put two and two together? This is Israel and the U.S. backing ISIS. That's my opinion. Play chess, my friends, not tiddlywinks. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. All right, we set the stage already. I'm not going to listen to the 10 stages already, but uh, here we are. Hour two. Hour two, Michael Savage to announce winners of $100,000 scholarship fund. Five college students recognized for essays on patriotism. It was announced this morning by Cumulus Media, Westwood One, uh, who I am proud to say distribute this show throughout America. And the essays can be read, and the winners' names can be seen on the top of www. No one uses that anymore. Dot michaelsavage.com. You don't have to put W anymore, but nevertheless, underneath that is another story. Savage continues domination of talk radio streaming. No matter what the little detractors would say, there is one man who has beat everyone else with a 25 share. The link will be up soon. Rush has a 12 share. And it's an important story because I don't, I'm not a member of the Rush cartel. I'm not represented by his brother who represents everyone else. Fine man, the lawyer, but doesn't represent me. And so, therefore, you never hear about me except on my own show, which is okay. I have a show. 
so today we're talking about a lot of other things, and I try to go somewhere else, which was, I wouldn't say nostalgia. I, I, I don't want to put that because that immediately categorizes things into a, a wrong box. I just went somewhere else with the show, and I hope you appreciate it. Many of you understood it. Some of you want to hear the normal, you know, fare of talk radio, which is uh, Obama bashing, which is, by the way, very, very important. He's probably, okay, I don't have to categorize why. Nevertheless, I don't want to do it today. I think you know who he is. You know he's like a mad pilot locking himself, who's locked himself inside the cabin of, an, of a jet. You're a passenger on it. He's locked the door. No one can get to him, and he's dr driving the plane into a mountaintop, and he won't listen to anybody. I mean, the, the most, the clearest example of this, even for the most dewy-eyed, stoned progressive, is the fact that ISIS, as it rampages across the Middle East, raping, murdering, kidnapping, blowing up thousand-year-old monuments. He's doing nothing. He won't bomb them. The Air Force reports he won't let them bomb them, won't stop them. Now we have reports that he's blocking the delivery of heavy weapons to uh, those trying to stop ISIS, mainly the Kurds, that he has stonewalled the delivery of such weapons. What does that tell you? It tells you that the ISIS group, as monstrous as these Nazis are, are in a way being given a little help from their friends. They're getting high with the help from their friends. They're getting by with a little help from their friends. They're executing children for crimes that include refusal to fast for Ramadan. You know, it's a religion of peace to them. And so uh, you would think that we'd all say, you got to stop this Holocaust against people. you got to stop them. So you ask, why is he not helping the Kurds? Why? 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 You can't figure it out yet? You can't figure out who your government really is and who they're working for as they erase our borders and flood America with millions of illegal aliens. That hasn't been enough for you. But I've done this for 21 years. I've told you about that for 21 years. So for me to continue doing it is boring to me. Let the others do it. Let them read my earlier books and make believe they discovered it. Let them get their scripts from my earlier books. It doesn't matter to me. What matters is that I don't want to do it right now. It's summer. So I'm asking you what you'd like me to do. In addition to reading the winner's names, which I will do this hour, I'd like to hear what you want me to do. Jason on KSFO Radio, what's on your mind? What would you like me to do? Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, Dr. Savage. I was, uh, in a scary way, was wondering if I like the stories when you talk about the wolf that visits you in your dreams. And I was wondering if you have, like I said, in a scary way, any, any new stories about that subject at all. No, you know, that wolf, thank God, has not visited me since I'm a young boy. You remember that story I told years ago, right? Yes. No, he scared the life out of me, and I didn't know who he was, but he did visit. I haven't seen him in a very long time. I, I don't think he needs me anymore. So, why, Have you had wolf dreams? Uh, no, sir. I just, I just from your dreams, I, I just, you know... Uh, no, 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 I get it. You don't, you don't have to say anymore. You want, you're curious about, has that evolved? Has the wolf revisited? You know, what have I done with that, 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 that nightmare, right? Isn't that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Nothing. Not, hasn't been back. Just for those of you who don't know that dream, I'll, I'll say it, because little children have terrible dreams sometimes. I was four or five sleeping in my little bed, and a wolf would come at night. My parents, we all slept in one bedroom. My parents would be in one bed. Maybe it was five feet away, looked like a thousand miles away. And my sister slept in a bed, and my brother slept in a bed. We were all in one room. My grandmother, I don't remember who. And a little apartment in the Bronx. And uh, no, she slept in the, in the living room, the grandmother, the immigrant grandmother. Uh, at night, a wolf would sometimes come and he'd pin me down, legs, arms, and I could feel him breathing over me. I could feel his breath and see his tongue. I would, my heart would almost stop and I'd want to scream out to my parents and my voice wouldn't work. Did you ever have one of those dreams? Ah, you know, where there's nothing com coming out. It was so frightening. Of course, if you wake up and tell your parents about the dream, they think you're nuts, right? I didn't even bother telling them because it was too frightening. But the wolf came to me, and then years later, as I was analyzing dreams, I came to understand that the wolf had tremendous significance in Egyptian society. You know that or not? I, I don't know if the guy is still on the line, but I found out years later that the wolf had tremendous significance in ancient Egyptian society. And so I assumed that I was a reincarnated ancient who was being brought back to those ancient times in my dreams through a visitation by the wolf. She was not necessarily an evil wolf. Remember, she didn't do anything to me. 
She just came and stood over me. You, you follow what I'm saying? And I realize a lot of this is obscure and esoteric, and to most people, they think that you're psychotic and you need medication and should go to a psychiatrist. I'll leave that to those of you who think that, to, to de deaden yourself with drugs. I don't do it. I take no drugs. I never have and I never will. No matter what pain I suffer, no matter what psychological pain I've been in, I've either written my way out, painted my way out, hiked my way out, or biked my way out of those woods. So thank you very much. I don't need pharmacological devices to do so. I think that they're, they poisoned America. I think it explains how a charlatan like Obama uh, can get away with what he's getting away with. I'm pretty sure it's because of the drug nature of society, but I, that's, again, getting too political. So there we are. Joe on WABC Radio. Joe, what's on your mind on this eclectic day? What's, uh, what's happening? Dr. Savage, good afternoon. I just want to tell you how you helped me put my life back together after a horrible accident. Um, I was already... Uh, putting myself through school. I was working on my doctorate in theoretical physics. I survived a commuter plane crash in 1999, um, which wasn't easy because uh, that made me afraid to fly as a passenger, and I love flying. Mm. I was able to continue working in academia um, until 2010. Uh, I was developing epilepsy because I had a horrible head injury. Uh, mm. By 2010, I became permanently uh, disabled, and I had to file for it, and that's what I lived on. And I was depressed and uh, 2012 because I basically lost my career in academia and that's, that's probably for the best because their doxology is the mental illness of liberalism well, wait, let, let me ask you about that Joe first of all I'm sorry for all of these terrible illnesses that you suffered from all of these from the trauma of the accident but are you telling me that even theoretical physics has been taken over by the goon squad are you telling me that these these frauds these communists have even penetrated pure science Savage, when I was teaching, I taught at the University of, am I allowed to say, where I yes. was teaching? Yes. I, I was teaching at the University of Medicine and Dentistry in Newark, New Jersey, which is now Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Great school. So, uh, well, yeah, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Please continue. I was teaching biophysics, which is the mechanics of how the body moves. Uh, I was also teaching advanced mathematics, statistics, uh, some chemistry, some toxicology. And in these classes, I was actually told by the dean of, the, of, 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 my, of my department that I had to include global warming as a part of the curriculum. <laughs> and uh, during, during, while, while this man was auditing my class, I put up a big equation on a blackboard, and uh, there were all these variables, and I factored out the variable D-E-A-N. And I wrote them, and I said, oh, look, we factored out a dean, and he got really upset. And I wound up leaving, and, and again, that was probably for the best, because it's just stifling liberalism. You know, you, I don't think you could have survived. If you have an independent mind, you could not survive the communists who have taken over the colleges. But I didn't know that it had entered pure science. I thought it was in the, in the non-subjects non like ethnic studies, I'm sure uh, uh, journalism, uh, <laughs> education, all of the soft subjects that idiots go into because there's no way to quantify what they're actually saying, so they make stuff up like microaggression or white privilege. They can get away with it because no one's, meant to, no one's saying, hey, moron, that's garbage. You know, why don't you cut the mustard and stop bellyaching about microaggression? Cut it out already. But anyway, there's no one left like me in academia, so what are you doing instead? I stood, well, I stood up to them and I left, which I said is probably, probably for the better. And, and yeah, but are you, making a, are you able to make a living? Well, no, but I'm going to tell you what your book did. I, I read your book, Train Tracks, and I saw how, how you grew and how you were able to go from being, uh, coming from an impoverished, uh, I, I believe, an immigrant family uh, to what I consider radio rock star. And uh, I figured out a way to put my life back together. And, and though I really can't work because of the epilepsy, uh, I have a service dog named Milo. I named him after a character in Catch-22. And mm -hmm. your book is right up there with it. But now I tutor under priv uh, privileged high school kids in math and science on Skype. Well, I prefer to ca actually call them underfunded because they're truly gifted. And I was, because of your storytelling, I was able to re-engineer my life so that I could still be a productive person. Uh, and in my field, and it's, and it's again... Yeah, but the world has lost a brilliant mind because of the communists who've taken over the colleges and infested it with lesser minds. Let's be very clear. These are like dim light bulbs put in there to teach garbage. So the whole university system is, is, is destroyed because men like you and I have been driven out by these goons. Anyway, I wish I could help you in some way. I want to thank you for the kind words. 
I'll send you another book to read, Countdown to Mecca. If I can help you in any way, please do stay in touch. The phone number is 855-407-282. That is the phone number. I wish to God I could get all of these calls. Let's go to Vanessa on WABC. Vanessa, go ahead, please. Oh, Vanessa, pl oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Don't, don't say it's a pleasure. What's on your mind? A dream you had. And you okay, please, Vanessa, let's start from the top. Hello, Vanessa. You're on talk radio with Michael Savage and millions of others. What's on your mind? Yes, reincarnation, Dr. Savage. You mentioned that in your dream. And reincarnation is something that you wonder about constantly. Yes. And the operative guidebook on that is called The Path to Reincarnation by Cohen, C-O-H-E-N. And in that very short book, he explains the simplicity of reincarnation. And that's why so many people accuse you, uh, because your mind is clear and you haven't taken the drugs, they accuse you as they accuse me of being uh, somewhat over the top with regard to eternal life. It's very simple. Your soul is durable. When your body... I, I, understand, I truly understand that, but how do you prove that to very bright people who are atheists? And I know some very bright people who say, rubbish, we are basically uh, uh, human machines. When our brain dies, we die. How do you prove to the contrary? Ergo, they're not very bright people, okay? Oh, no, 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 you're wrong. <laughs> No, they're very bright people, but they don't happen to believe in, in the movement of the soul. The GPS, that is the government public schools, are so destructive that the January 30, 06 edition of New York Magazine. Okay, I, I don't want to go backwards. I hear you, but let's, let's broaden it out another time. I had a discussion last night with a friend of mine, a neuropsychiatrist, a very bright man who doesn't believe in God and doesn't believe in in anything, you know, and he's a friend of mine because he, he has a great mind and he knows science and medicine. So I don't have any doxies which prohibit people from talking that I will talk with. You know, all I care about is intelligence and knowledge. You know, the rest is uh, what their belief system is there. So he says, that's the guy who said to me, I treated a Kabbalist who was a complete phony. And the guy died and uh, he said, you know, he, he, may, he hoodwinked everybody in Los Angeles with his Kabbalah and mysticism made a fortune, and he was having sex with all of the young women, even though he was a Jewish mystic, so-called. He was a, f a phony. And I said, okay, so what's the point of the story? He said, I'd like to know where he went when he died, because as far as I can tell, when he died, he went nowhere. There was nothing there. His brain died, and he died. That's what he was saying to me. He said, where was the reincarnation? That's what he said. I said, I don't know. But So I've often said, the reason God set this up with a, with a stone, it's like a stone wall between us and our knowledge of our past. And the reason God did that is that we, we live our life now. We don't want to live in the past or the future. He wants us to live now in this life. If we had knowledge of all of our past lives, could you go on a second? Could you really go on now? There are people who know, know these things. You know that. There are people who can transcend this time and this place through medication, through meditation. There are religions which specialize in, in motions that will take you there and take you back. But I don't want to be a, pro, you know, I don't want to go in those places right now. This is a, a national talk show for millions of people. I need, I need to entertain you and keep you on another pathway. So I'm not going to go there. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. You know, not more. Look, it's a show like this. I could go for five, six hours right now. And I'll tell you, you know, time is related to gravity. In the sense that when I am in this uh, state of mind, there is no time because it's an hour and a half into the show and I feel like I've just gotten started. I don't have enough time to do what I want to do today. Just the stories and where we're going to go with them and the calls I'm getting and the announcement that's coming up, which I haven't gotten to yet on the winners of the scholarship and all of the other stuff I need to do, I, I don't have the time for it. On the days, though, that I'm just hammering politics, it could be so burdensome that an hour can wear me out. The guys get burned out in an hour. I get worn out in an hour. You get worn out in, in 10 minutes. And you start flipping the channels. You think I don't know that what you're feeling? Believe me, I know after 21 years what the audience is feeling. So let me reset the dial again on the Savage Nation. I'm known for storytelling, and I'm telling some stories today. I read two from my archives, both written in about the 1980s. And I thought they were nice. I, you know what I realized in reading them, what to do with them? 
is uh, that I'm probably going to do a revision of Train Tracks under a new title, and I'll put some of those old stories that I never found until now into that revised vi edition. I'm going to retitle it. It was a terrible title, by the way. I wouldn't call it that. And it wouldn't be a picture of a train. It'd be a picture. Are we out of time? How is this possible? Because gravity. When there is no gravity, there's no time. Right? There's no gravity, meaning nothing's pulling me down. Nothing's weighing on me. So there's no time. Time and gravity. I'm trying to explain it to you. You see how it flies and you feel it, right? You listeners know what I'm talking about. You feel the same thing. When I am light, you're light. When I'm heavy and burdened, you're heavy and burdened, and you can only take so much of it. So I think you hear enough of it from the others, so I'll do my own thing. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. It is the uh, Savage Nation, and I want to set the uh, tone again with one of my favorite sound bites in history. It'll take you back in time, even if you weren't or you know, an adult at the time. I want you to hear three in a row, and then I'm going to tell you something new. Go ahead, Robert. Play the triple. As the drive hits the deep right field, that ball is going, going. It is gone. Maris hitting his second home. Sixth homer of the ball game. Two short of the record of eight and one game. 11 to 3, New York. Turn the clock back. It's spinning backwards in time. That was, of course, one of the great broadcasters, Mel Allen, who I still think ha has had one of the greatest voices in radio history. I grew up listening to him when I was a wee lad wearing a polo shirt and shorts with a radio glued to my ear. Uh, when I was listening to baseball, and I outgrew it at age 11 when most people outgrow baseball. And, uh, I, I don't know if Mr. Allen is still alive, but I loved his voice. The next one was the midget, and I'm not trying to knock him. I love the guy. Uh, I forget he's actually a person who lived in Brooklyn, had a yacht, uh, used to entertain women on his boat, allegedly. That was, he used to do the, the call for Philip Morris ad. He'd come into like a fake hotel lobby and he'd sell Philip Morris. He in some way was responsible for my father's early death, but okay, I can't hold it against him. I smoked the unfiltered cigarettes. I got the secondhand smoke, and I'm still living. A bunch of rubbish, that is. I love the secondhand smoke is the biggest threat. Not ISIS, no. Not the fanatics on the college campuses that were killing learning itself. No, secondhand smoke is my biggest threat. Not the illegal aliens who are pouring over the borders, one-third of whom are in prison. One-third of all prisoners, rather, are illegal aliens who have committed murder, rape, burglary, you name it. So Trump was right. In other words, if one third of all our prisoners are illegal aliens and a good percentage of them come from south of the border, what in what Trump said is false? I don't get it. Where'd they come from? Oh, it's, it's, an, it's an embarrassing uh, statistic, huh? Yeah, it's an inconvenient truth. Where's Al Gore when we don't need him? So anyway, there it is. That's what I'm saying. So here we are. Calls are great. WABC, JD, you're up next on a Savage Nation. What's on your mind, JD? Hi, I'm a I'm a new listener, and one of the first shows I heard from you was you were talking about your brother, and I just fell in love with you. And I just want to know if I can get a T-shirt that says Savage Nation so I can really just broadcast. Oh, your that's out. sweet. I used, to have, I used to have stuff like that, like hats and shirts and floor mats, but I, I don't have them anymore. They're around somewhere on the Internet. If I had them, I'd send them to you. The only thing I can send you right now is a copy of my blockbuster novel, Countdown to Mecca. But thank you for the kind comments, um, Miss JD on the Savage Nation. Matt on, uh, no, let's go to MAL. WMAL, Washington, D.C. Mark, you're next up from the nation's capital on the Savage Nation. What's on your mind? Hello, Michael. I uh, was. You asked earlier what could uh, you do for us today, and, and my hope is that you can make me laugh as much as you did yesterday on my drive home from work. Yeah, okay, but what did I do that tickled your funny bone? This uh, The monologue that you did about the, uh, as you call them, the Girl Scouts sitting around the cabinet room trying to uh, drum up these uh, fake Fourth of July terrorist attacks. Oh, the oh, all the, oh, okay. You mean all of the girls running our intelligence agencies? Uh, my imaginary scenario of them making believe that we're going to be attacked? I, I had to pull off to the side of the road. I was laughing so hard, and there's... You're right, there's not enough of that on the radio, which is how I ended up listening to you, as a matter of fact. So, How did you wind up listening to the show? Please tell us. Well, 
Well, uh, not long ago, I can't give you a great time frame. I'm going to say 12, 15 months ago. I could be wrong. There was a programming change on WMAL, and one of the usual folks that's in the afternoon drive stuff went off, and I could have followed him to a different station, but forgive me, but you heard one show, you heard them all. And I said, well, I don't know who this guy is. My son has mentioned him a few times, but I haven't had a chance to listen to him. Let me uh, let me give him a try. And I, I have to tell you, with the, the courtesy you give your callers and the provocative discussions you have, although I don't agree with you all the time, I just I agree with you most of the time. And uh, I, I'm, I'm really hooked now, and I appreciate what you do. That's well said, and there's no way to add to that commentary other than to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I want to send you my novel, Countdown to Mecca, which is available in bookstores and is a great read. And by the way, it's prophetic in what could happen in the very near future. Now let's go to the next call. I will get to the five scholarship winners. That's what I'm saying. I meant to do it at the top of the last hour. I'm almost at the end of hour two. I'm going to do it before this hour is over. I have to. Matt on WABC, fire away. You're on the Savage Nation. Yeah, Dr. Savage, you said two things today uh, about the wolf story and something else about trusting that God will punish those that are doing this disgrace to our nation and the world. But let me go back to the wolf story. I told the call screener, when I was a child, I used to have the same exact experience. And this went on for years, and I was almost too afraid to tell my parents. It continued through my teenage years. Religiously, I would never go see a spiritualist because I felt it was like it was wrong to go see someone. Well, finally, when I was in my late teens, I went to see a psychic, and she told me, that it was a jackal, and the jackal was haunting me from the past, and she said I'd been alive several times. And, you know, after I saw this woman, I'm not saying she had any kind of power. I'm, I'm a believer in God. All I'm saying is it went away. I don't know. I Inexplicably, um, I can't explain it. The same thing used to happen. He used to pin me down. I could barely breathe. I wanted <laughs> to scream out for help, but I could not do it. And it, it just was... Uh, I, when no, it's pretty... You know, if you read the Bible, it says you're... What, what is it? Your old men shall dream dreams, and your children shall prophesy. I think that's how it's put in the Bible. I don't know the exact quote. I, I think I'm close to it. So I think those of us who were visited by animal forms were the prophets in some way. We were, we were prophets. We were being visited by animals to awaken us to who we were, and some of us kill it or it's killed for us because people are afraid of these powers, by the way. You know that, don't you? I, I did not know that. Um, the most oh, absolutely. Most people, most people are afraid to think. Most people don't remember their dreams because they are not trained to do so and they don't want to remember them. They're frightened of them. I spent 18 or 20 years doing dream analysis, even with my children. I taught, Every morning we ask, I mean, they sit down, we'd have breakfast, and I'd say, what did you dream last night? Because I learned it from an, uh, an American Indian as uh, something that was done in his tribe. So I learned a lot from different groups along the way. And so you, you're cured because the psychic told you that it was something that you were tr supposed to purge from yourself? No, I, I, she had told me that I'm supposed to do something great in the future, and eventually the, the jackal, she called it a jackal, doesn't need me anymore, which I found odd. I don't know why this jackal that used to visit me needed me. Um, but it was it was very alarming. I I even went to see a priest. They they performed an exorcism on me. They I, I can't explain it. But I'll tell you, I've been free of it for a good fifteen years now. And um, I've three. Well, let's learned. let's hope that this doesn't re-trigger your, your childhood nightmares because I don't want to be responsible for that. <laughs> Thank you for the call. I'm sending you my novel countdown to Mecca. Isaiah says, and the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fat link together. And a little child shall lead them. So what is that all about? What was the, the prophet Isaiah saying? And a little child shall lead them. I would say let's not underestimate our little children. They're closer to God than we are. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so that's a separate story unto itself. 855-400, I forgot my number. I don't even know the number. 855-400-SAVAGE is the number. Line number four, Linda, KBOI Radio. Linda, what's on your mind? I believe the wolf has something to do with you saving this nation. Uh, and it does indeed have something to do with Egypt. I it does have a lot to do with Egypt. Tell the audience what you know about the wolf as symbol in Egypt, ancient Egypt. Well, Joseph of Egypt was, received a blessing 
that Red Hair inherit a land uh, with a chain of mountains running through it from the North Pole to the South Pole. So, I, I mean, you know, that's easy to describe. We'd know that would be this nation. And uh, Ephraim, his son Ephraim and Benjamin intermarried. And so there's many of Ephraim and Benjamin living here. And I believe the wolf coming to you was a representation uh, of you helping to save this nation. Well, I'm one of the voices in the wilderness, that's for sure. I don't know that any one single person can save us from this evil that has uh, penetrated the highest offices of the land and is controlling us in ways we could never imagine. And so I don't know what it's going to take from the point of view of a man to save us from this evil. But as I've said yesterday, and I believe in my heart, it will take an act of God to save us from this madman. And I believe it will be an act of God that does save us from this madman. I don't know what that means, though. I think it's and, there arose, and there arose a new king over Egypt who knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass that when they... Well, I can read more of Exodus, but I don't have to. Most people can read it for themselves. I, before I go, though, you seem to be well-read in the Bible and in mythology. Do you know what the wolf symbolizes in Egyptian mythology? No, the only thing I know that it, it is a symbol of the tribe of Benjamin. Okay, th that's interesting. There is another, there is another uh, wolf symbolism that's very important. Napoleon and Napoleonic furniture often has the wolf symbol on it. You know that as well if you're into, into, into furniture and, and such. Many of Napoleon's images had wolves in carved into them a wolf insignias so whatever that means i don't really know my friend but thank you a novel goes out to you a novel of the novel called countdown to mecca i got to start reading the winners this is unbelievable on the savage nation so let me do that let me go with you those of you who are near a, a device an iphone or whatever let's go together to michaelsavage.com because i posted it up there i don't know if I'm, i can't read the essays today Okay, do a roll of the drums if we have. We don't have a roll of the drums. We'd have to get them. Okay, we're on www.michaelsavage.com. On the right says, here are the winning essays in the Savage Scholarship Contest. What does it mean to be an American? And first I will read to you the, uh, the um, pr press release put out this morning to the media by Cumulus. Five college students recognized for essays on patriotism. Atlanta, July 1, 2015. Today, Michael Savage, Westwood One National Radio host and best-selling author, announces that five exceptional college students have been selected to receive scholarships for their responses to his essay contest entitled, What Does It Mean to Be an American? Each of the students will receive a $20,000 scholarship over a two-year period. Michael Savage launched the unprecedented $100,000 scholarship fund in early 2015 with the intention of promoting traditional American values among conservative college students. Savage received approximately 1,700 entries, and the five carefully selected winning essays honor the principles that America was built upon and discuss the country's past, present, and future. One winner wrote this, quote, I declare myself to be a part of this new generation that will lead by example and reignite the torch of American greatness so that every eye from every corner of the earth might be able to see the light of liberty shining from America again, close quote. That is a college student, by the way not a politician. Savage said, I hope to continue the scholarship program next year. There are so many deserving patriotic students who have been silenced by anti-American rhetoric at U.S. colleges. Hopefully these scholarships will encourage others to stand up for America. And now without any further ado, here are the winners. We have a roll in the Congratulations to Alex Peterson for writing his essay, Obscured Resilience. Congratulations to James Lutak for writing his essay entitled Dreams. Congratulations to Heather Fisher for writing What It Means to Be an American. Congratulations to Curtis Butterfield for writing Evil Despises Competition. Congratulations to Mark Bragg for his winning essay. And you can read all of these essays on michaelsavage.com. If I have a few minutes, I'll read them in the next segment. And I've invited these young people on the program next week 
to talk about how they came to write the essays and such like that. There are some wonderful lines and ideas in these essays. Let me begin with one or two lines here. James Ludak in his essay, Dreams, is a winner. Here's how he began the essay. This is, remember, a college student. It is the morning of April 29th, 1945. The men of the 42nd Division of the United States 7th Infantry approach a strip of railroad outside of a large industrial complex. The spring breeze fills their lungs as they press on towards their destination. Suddenly, the sweet breeze is no longer fresh, but turns into a familiar smell to these men who have made their homes on the battlefield. It is the smell of rotting flesh baking in the sun, and it pervades every thought of these men as they approach these forsaken boxcars sitting on the tracks. The sounds of shots ring out as the locks of the boxcar doors are shot off, and the door opens to reveal its cargo. A bloody hand reaches out of the door as it opens. No, not reaches, but instead limply falls out as the rest of the corpse follows it. The door of the boxcar is flung open, the rest of the way to reveal what is inside. Nearly 70 bodies of men, women, and children are stuffed inside. Their emaciated bodies shriveled around their skeletons and eyes sunken in their face. Nearly all of their hands are cut open and bloody from beating the sides of the boxcar that they were shoved into like cattle and forced to endure conditions that not even an animal should be subjected to. The men of the 42nd turn their eyes from the horror in front of them to the industrial complex that is before them. There's much more from this young man who wrote this essay and how he concludes it is very important that you read at michaelsavage.com. These are the scholarship winners. That's one of them. More to follow. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. The only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. I, am the, I have only a minute, so uh, one of the winning essays is from this gentleman, James Ludak, who I've never met. So he opens with the 42nd Division, breaking open the boxcars and dead bodies falling out. And he sees this, this horror. The, the, the soldiers see the horror. And he concludes, he said, let's take an honest look across the globe together. What country holds the torch for freedom that all others look to and try to imitate? What country makes its hobby destroying evil men with dreams of destruction? When people flee their country due to oppression and tyranny, where did they dream of going? Without any apology or shame, there should be no American who's afraid to say, America is the last great hope of mankind, and without her, the entire world is condemned to live out the dreams of evil men. There's much more in this young man's essay. There's a wonderful essay by a young lady named Heather Fisher on what it means to be an American. I'll read more in the next hour. You can read them at michaelsavage.com. Thanks for listening. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. Welcome to hour number three to Savage Nation. Bob Dylan, one of America's prophets, one of America's greatest prophets in his poetry and his song, no question about it. In this program today, I've gone from nostalgia to, oh, I don't know, some news stories to the winners of the scholarship contest. And I named all the winners and I read from one of the essays. I'll continue to do so in this hour. I invite you to join the dialogue of the Savage Nation by calling 855 407 either with a comment or a request. Again, the phone number is 855-400-7282. Let's take a quick call on one of the essays that I began to read. Dove on WABC in New York. Thanks for holding on. What's on your mind, Dove? Dr. Savage, I am scared to think about how our government would treat a Holocaust today. And it's just eerie. Well, you, you, you don't have to think, think so. any further. Obama's ignoring a Holocaust of today. It's going on right now. What do you call killing, raping, murdering, and selling young girls into slavery but a holocaust? Miserable. And I'm scared to read Countdown to Mecca to see what you have to say there, Dr. Savage. I'm serious. 
Well, I'm sending you a copy of the novel, but uh, you're watching a Holocaust and Obama's doing nothing. Obama saves all of his hatred for the American people who oppose his socialist policies, and he has no vitriol for Iran, no vitriol for ISIS, no vitriol for Al-Qaeda. So there's your answer. What do you mean what he would do if there was a Holocaust? There is a Holocaust. Stay on the line. KSFO, Jim, welcome to the program. What's on your mind, Jim? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk to you for a second about the image that you've created for yourself, which I think is, you know, really brilliant uh, in a lot of different ways, but kind of specifically through the music. Uh, I'm, I'm a long-time listener from way back. I've been listening to you for quite a long time, but, but I noticed right off the bat the music. See, I'm a musician, too, and I just, it, you, you had an edgy sound, a very edgy guitar uh, sound that, that just goes perfectly with your voice. And a lot That's of interesting. Just, well, a lot of it's old rock and roll. I mean, that's not that edgy. It's kind of melodically beautiful. But over the years, I've also played some edgy music like Rammstein, which would approximate me when I'm in an angry mood. But I am not in, a, in an angry mood much anymore because that's for the beginners in talk radio uh, in the sense that they think they need to be angry to keep you listening. I found you don't have to be angry. In fact, people will listen to you longer if you present intelligence rather than false rage. Yeah. Well, I, I was actually referring to the music that you come in and out of your show on. Oh, yes. With. I forget that. Rock. Robert, who is, who's that group? I forget who they are. It's. Uh, well, I, I think I know who it is. I won't say on the radio. But. Yeah, no, it's it's great music. It's, it's, it's heavy metal. It's metal music. So are you saying that the music matches me or doesn't? It does match you, and it's brilliant, and, and how closely it matches. You have a very powerful voice. I'm sure you already know that, but... You know, your voice, and, and it's an edgy voice, too. There's, it's a, there's an urgency about it, and it's perfectly matched with the music. And I was just kind of wondering how you, how you went about, you know, picking that and choosing that. You had it from just the through, Just I, through the ear, just purely through the ear. I remember when I picked that bumper music. I think it was, was it ACDC, some of it? I think so. And uh, Metallica, loved the early Metallica, loved their music because it matched my feelings at the time, and it still does match the show. But, uh, you know, I want to speak about voice for a minute. You're a musician, so you can hear my voice, correct? Yes. I actually have a, a, I have a singer's voice, incidentally, but I don't sing. Isn't that interesting? It is, and you have a very melodic voice for a speaking voice. Okay. Well, that's all part and parcel of why I love radio. I was born for it. Jim, let me send you a July 4th present sure to drive your adrenaline and testosterone through the ceiling. <laughs> it's my novel, Countdown to Mecca, and I thank you for being a musician who listens. KSFO, Misty, welcome to the Savage Nation. Misty, what's on your mind? Hi, uh, great to talk to you. Um, it, the vision that you had about the wolf, uh, what I sense is that it's a premonition. I also got premonitions when I was a, when I was a child. And I think it's the placement where God put you in this life that you would be under attack from the wolf. And there's many scriptures, I just put it up right now, that you can uh, also look at. Um, the other one didn't come up, which says, beware of the dog, beware of the mutilation. The other one here says, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they will trample them under their, under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. And I think it's just... A, a vision of what you're dealing with as being somewhat prophetic. Um, the wolf. Well, I think all of us in talk radio would like to believe we have a little touch of the prophecy in us or the prophet. And so I would say that there has to be truth to that in some regard for shows that survive for any length of time and have a large audience. People are listening for a reason. It can't just be because they're reading the news or because uh, whatever. It's a voice. There must be something in the message that's that's appealing to people, right? Exactly. Well, well, definitely, Michael. Michael, I mean, I know that, that the information that you get is from God because it is the truth. 100%. And I want to say... Well, but I, I, go, I go off message an awful lot. You know, I get zany and I get... I get silly sometimes, and I think that's all part of a human personality. So I try not to hide those. I, I wouldn't call them blemishes. I try not to hide the, the other sides of my, my nature from the audience. I think that's part of being successful and establishing a bond with people, which is being as human as you can in an age of, of these false sound biters out there. You know, I think that's part of the appeal of this program. It's what keeps me going. But I don't want to be too self-serving in this conversation. I do want to say this. 
I don't know how to put it without sounding preachy or whatever, but I may as well just lay it out there, you know, because I was talking yesterday about mysticism. Did you catch that part of the show yesterday? Yes, I did. Did you hear the one about the founders of one of the deeply religious Jewish sects who was walking with his grandfather and the grandfather said to him that every blade of uh, every every stalk of corn has life in it and all of that. And the kid was ripping up a leaf in pieces. And the grandfather said nicely to him, do you understand that even that leaf has a touch of God in it? You remember that that little story? Yes. Okay. I believe that is true, and I, I, I've lived my life that way without reading a book about it. I've always been that way. In other words, I let a fly out of a window. If I can let a, a spider out of a, a window, I have a cup and a piece of paper I'll use. So what is that all about? I still eat animals. I still eat animal flesh. I don't eat as much as I did when I was unconscious as a child. I, I try to avoid certain animals, but I still eat chicken, and I, I still eat fish. Uh, but nevertheless, what I'm saying is I see the divinity of life, and I believe that we're all a piece of the same organism. I know that sounds insane to the average human who thinks he is the be-all and end-all of life and that we ourselves are the only living creature that matters. I do actually believe that we're all part of one living organism. I know it sounds insane. I've had the vision that we're all part of the same organism, meaning all living creatures, no matter how despicable they may be a skunk a black widow spider a snake a wolf whatever it is a puppy dog uh, a mountain gorilla we're all part of the same living organism we're actually one organism all of us and when you kill the others you kill yourself so you could say i am the eagle if you kill the eagle you're killing yourself if you kill the honeybee you're killing yourself do you understand where i'm coming from with this yeah, can you hear me? Okay, so so that so that insight is what leads to a finer understanding of what the environmental movement was originally, which is to be protective of life on Earth. It's since turned into some big lie that has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with, with profiteering. So let me go on with that. So last night I was lying in bed, and for some reason, I don't know whether I could sleep or I couldn't sleep. I don't know if I was awake or dreaming. I don't remember. I do remember speaking to God in my bed. Okay, take it for it. Turn the radio off. I know it sounds ridiculous if you're listening to this on a car radio. It doesn't sound like he's telling the truth, but I really have to go with what I'm telling you. I'm laying in bed, and I start to breathe deeply, almost going into a meditative state, and I'm getting into this state. I know when I get there, I get very close to it, and sometimes I, I walk away from it. Sometimes I push it away. Sometimes I drink it away. Sometimes I ignore it. Now I decided to go into it because there are too many things forcing me down this direction. So I start to talk to God, and I try to reach God, and I do reach God in my, he doesn't answer me, by the way. He doesn't speak, he doesn't have a voice. Uh, I, I don't believe God has a voice and comes into my, I'm not Jimmy Carter. I did not see God appear in my living room in a white robe telling me what to do. But I speak to him, he doesn't speak to me. And I feel him, I don't see him. And as I breathe, I ask him something. And I ask him, and I come to the understanding that we actually have the power within us to live or die. We can actually will ourselves to get better. We can will ourselves to get sicker. We all know that. And it leads me back to the power of prayer. Many of you who listen to this show are very religious. And you go to churches, you go to synagogues, and you do pray. And you don't do so rotely. Many of you do so because you actually reach God in your prayer, which is what the original meaning of prayer was. A great church would lead you to actually praying to God rather than just going through the mumbo-jumbo. And so that is often lost today in the, in the mumbo jumbo rather than in the actual, you know, you read the, the Psalms and the, you don't feel anything. How many people have gone into houses of worship and come out feeling like it was a bad movie? There was nothing there. And you say, ah, I'm not going to go back. I didn't feel anything. Because a great leader in a house of worship would be able to lead you in prayer to God, to feeling God yourself. And that, unfortunately, is not that common anymore because there aren't that many great, there are not that many great uh, uh, leaders in, in religion anymore. So what I'm saying is I actually felt that we do hold the power of eternal life in our own hearts and in our own hands. We can reach God. We can talk to him. So where am I going with this? We're going back to the essays that won the contest. Why? Because these essays that I chose after a long selection process of 1700, in some ways, I think, were, the, were um, inspired by a contact with a higher power. Call it God if you want. So you read some of these essays and you say, how do these young people get to come up with these words? Do you know that we scan them 
for, uh, uh, what do you call it, plagiarism. We scan them for copying. They're all disqualified. If we find even a sentence that's taken from somewhere else, they would be disqualified. And they all had to sign a disclaimer saying it's all original. It's astounding when you listen to these essays. So let me read the first one. The first winner of the, uh, uh, of the award is Alex Peterson, and his essay is entitled Obscured Resilience. So let me read something. Tell me if you know a college student who can write like this. When peering through the drab filter of society that is fostered by the media and those who hold positions of, positions of power, we are made to feel inferior and helpless at the whim of a higher dominion. This feeling of inferiority is created by harbingers of hatred in America as a way of diminishing dreams while constantly infecting minds with their pessimism. In a volatile time when confidence appears to have eroded, there remains a glimmer of hope behind the shroud of hopelessness. He goes on. Within the past 50 years, our country has appeared to change for the worse. Many impediments to the average American have burgeoned out of the fabrics of equality and acceptance. True Americans have been evicted from places of power and relocated to the back of the line because of their patriotism and deep-rooted love for the country. It is by way of hard-working Americans that this nation subtly remains the greatest the world has seen. It is the views of these people that continue to be suppressed the most. Furthermore, it is without their patriotic views that the country would no longer be capable of existing the way it once did. Remember, this is a college student. I'll read another few uh, paragraphs from it. As the attempt to degrade the American spirit has progressed, love for America is continuously made to look like an extremist belief. Constantly, there are critics who claim the American dream and by extension the American spirit is dead. The thirst for success becomes impossible for those who hold these truths. While these pseudo-Americans blame everyone but themselves, those who are self-reproachful consistently thrive. This country's unparalleled privilege to achieve is no more absent today than it was generations ago. The only difference is the quality of the individual attempting to realize his goals. He concludes like this. While the prospect of hope appears to dwindle throughout the country, an invisible majority possesses infutable Americanism, irrefutable Americanism. They continue to instill the values of hard work and independence in their children, who will someday continue to lead this nation down its path of greatness. Although these people remain unseen, they are the ones who empower America to remain the elite power in the world. It is only with the future rise of true Americans that this country will be able to seek greater prosperity. Here's the last sentence. The responsibility for the future of this country not only relies on those who are cognizant of the impending risks of decline, but on those of whom but those, but on those who strive to reverse the degradation that has already occurred. The willingness to accept this task to prevail as a nation is what separates genuine Americans from those who are American in name only. It was written by an applicant named Alex Peterson. It's entitled Obscured Resilience. You can read it for yourself on michaelsavage.com. He's one of the five winning essays in the Savage Scholarship Contest. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. All right, welcome back. Listen, I'll read the rest of the essays next week. You can read them yourself. The winners are announced on michaelsavage.com. I actually get tired reading anyone else's writing. Would you believe it? It, 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 it tired as good as the writing is. It took my energy down, and it, you know I'm not like others in the business who actually read scripts. You don't know it, but Summit Talk Radio did not have an original sentence. It's just read. It's a script they read. Okay, good luck to them. If you don't know it, you don't have to know it. When I read a script, I get tired. To me, if it's intuitive and um, off the, shall I say, free, it's free association keeps me going. So what would you like me to do? Uh huh. KBOI, Bob, welcome to the Savage Nation. What's on your mind, Bob? Well, Michael, uh, yesterday you were talking about uh, what gets you through. And uh, one of the things that I've come across recently was about a year ago in a small mountain town in Idaho, I, I saw two uh, petunias growing out of the asphalt when it was 104 degrees right <laughs> the curb. And to me, that means, you know. Absolutely tenacity when i've seen street weeds growing in the cracks of a pavement in san francisco and new york it helps me go on 
just look at nature and it'll inspire you wherever you turn. Isn't that what you're saying? Yes, that's why I like to get Absolutely. Up. Can you imagine that? How does a street weed grow in the middle of a, of a pavement? How? Where does it get its life force from? What do you... Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Maybe the only one here is Republican, good, Democrat, bad. You know, maybe they want to hear that from the conservative media. <laughs> Laughing all the way to the bank. That's a racket, man. The whole thing's a racket. That's why I'm sick of it all. Sick of it all. Give it all away. So anyway, I could do the news. I don't want to talk about a news story locally. News crew robbed in San Francisco. The camera operator was pistol whipped. While these losers here in San Francisco were covering a murder, which they're covering up because it was a tourist shot in front of a family by an unidentified thug, shot her dead near the ferry terminal. So these news crews go down there to cover the, the, uh, the crime. They get beaten up, their camera robbed, and the idiot with the camera gets hit over the head with a gun, and they don't report what the robber looked like. Even though they were re beaten up and robbed of their cameras, they won't report who did it to them. It shows you what liberalism is, how insane they are. We have no news media in the Bay Area. We have no newspaper. The newspaper is a mimeograph sheet of the uh, Nancy Pelosi, Diane Feinstein, Willie Brown organization. Anything that must must go through their organizations to be approved. So no pictures of thugs, no crime for the tourists to know about. It's enough to make a sane man cry, but I'm not going to cry. I'm going to continue to do my show. The top 25 streaming radio talk shows came out today again, and the editor says Savage stuns the digital ratings and rankings world, extending his winning streak online and on mobile with massive margins dominating the competition as the number one streaming talk show host with, again, an unprecedented 25 share. Rush Limbaugh, 12.8 share. Laura Ingram, a 6.0 share. Glenn Beck, a 5.6 share. Sean uh, Hannity, 3.7, etc. And some very good people on the list. But apparently the youngsters who listen to me on the stream are tuning into the Savage Nation for whatever the reasons are. Now, the audience today, Thursday, is probably smaller than most days. It happens before holidays. Most normal people are on the road or they've gone where they're going. They change their listening habits, and they're not listening to talk radio, which is good because it slows things down a bit, and we all need to change our tempo. We need to change our pace. I went into my written archives. I found some uh, very, very short stories that were written. One of them is called uh, Newly Over, April 3rd, 1989, written in a North Beach room. And it's three pages long. It has no resemblance to any people living or dead. There is no resemblance to any people who are actually alive. It is fiction. It begins like this. Yellow sheets, handwritten, which has got amazing penmanship. Newly Over. The winter was nearly over. The winter was newly over. Their little valley radiated that natural magnetism known through eternity, again tossing over whether to move out of there forever, sell the house to Manhattan, refine the excitement of the streets and people, to recapture their East Village youth. No, not so much that, but to reconnect with reactive people, uh, as it was put by Mary, now so pissed at all these non-reactive Bay Area types. So they were talking, they were taking one of their fairly regular walks. Savage. Um, all right, you heard the story earlier. I don't want to replay the story. And so I'm going to just continue to do the show live because I don't want to replay for you a story that I already read on the program. And so we'll open for business, as usual, on the Savage Nation. Let's go to the callers in San Francisco. Lou, you're incensed over that story, aren't you? Lou, I fire away. What's on your mind? I am, and uh, I'm uh, uh, glad to see that you're on, on the case here. It's a problem that you've mentioned before about uh, a combination of the cops and the VA and the media all suppressing identities of suspects. So any thinking person is going to start wondering when you have ISIS calling for attacks here, when you have uh, Holder, Sharpton, Obama uh, stoking the flames of, uh, of uh, the racial strife, uh, could it been because this lady was wearing a cross, a star of David, could it have been her color, who knows? It says news crews robbed while live on air covering SF slang, and these dummies, these dummies, these dummies who were robbed and beaten up in the news business won't even report what the suspect looked like, you hear this? Be on the lookout for a man. It, and, and it's unbelievable to me, you can't say Muslim, 
You can't show anyone of color who's a criminal. And so the country continues to sink into crime and into insanity. The woman who was shot, by the way, on the pier, this is the real tragedy here, not that the news people are being beaten up. She has a name. Catherine Steinel had just sent her mother a quintessential San Francisco photo. She was a tourist. Picture was taken of her, her father, and a family friend on the picturesque waterfront of the Embarcadero. By the way, it's blocks away from where I reside from time to time. But five minutes later, with her father's arm around her shoulder, the 32-year-old Pleasanton native suddenly collapsed on the ground on Pier 14, just south of the ferry building. It was about 6.30 p.m. Wednesday, and she had been struck in the chest by a bullet. She died two hours later at the hospital, according to her mother, Liz Sullivan. She just kept saying, Dad, help me, help me. It's just unbelievable. Now, here's how your newspaper, owned by Nancy Pelosi, Diane Feinstein, and Willie Brown and the left-wing goon squad, report who did it. Police detained a suspect shortly after the killing, which appeared to be random, said Officer Grace Gatpanden, a San Francisco police spokesmouth. The man who was not identified immediately was being questioned by homicide inspectors. What do you mean it was random? What do you mean it was random? What does that mean by random? He went up to hold him up randomly? Or what do you mean by random? It was not clear who, if anyone, was the intended target of the shooting, Gatpandan said. After getting a description from several witnesses, she said, authorities tracked and arrested the suspect about a mile south of the pier along the Embarcadero at Townsend Street. The woman had been walking with her father, Jim, age 68, when she was shot in the chest from a distance from a gunman whom none of the family members saw. Her father immediately began CPR before paramedics rushed her in an ambulance to the hospital. She fought for her life, Sullivan said, adding that her daughter's heart had stopped two times and was restarted on the way to the hospital. It was a battle and she just didn't make it. So here it is. Here's the story. That's the story. But who did it? We don't know. We don't know who did it. We're pretty sure that if he looked like Timothy McVeigh, the brave news folks, the camera carriers and the microphone holders would certainly have the picture blasted across the front of the newspaper. The slaying, San Francisco's 26th this year, was particularly shocking in that it happened in broad daylight in a place where tourists gather to take in the views. Really? No kidding. You mean there's crime in this liberal paradise? How could there be crime here? There's no crime. After all, earlier today, two television crews who were reporting on the killing were mugged at the scene with a masked gunman, again not described, pistol whipping a camera operator. They won't describe the man who beat them up. The man took cameras from the two local reporters before he jumped into a black BMW and fled. No picture of the man. They're all shocked that it would happen in such a progressive city where everyone is so tolerant. But you see, my friends, you know the definition of a conservative? It's a liberal who's been mugged. You never hear that one? I learned that 40 years ago. And so it goes. And so it goes. Who was the shooter? Does anyone know who the shooter was or what the shooter looked like? Was he a man? Was he a woman? What was his race? Does it matter? Well, no, of course it doesn't matter. Why, that's racist to ask what the race is of a killer. You might actually catch him. Catch him. And you can't have that. Because it's better that one guilty man go free than 99 innocent be bothered by reading the race of the perpetrator. And so it marches on. Now let's go to michaelsavage.com for a connected story, which I saw this morning, which really, I'll tell you, toasted my cornflakes. Columbia Props paper, Racial Microaggressions in Everyday Life. You will not believe this story. You have to read it to see how insane some of these goons are in the universities. Simply asking someone, where are you from, or calling America the land of opportunity is now considered offensive at some once colleges and universities, where such microaggressions are, de are detailed in training programs and seminars for new faculty and staff. Other examples of offensive statements from these morons who couldn't get a job in a toilet 
if it wasn't for affirmative action, include statements such as, I believe the most qualified person should get the job. That's no longer allowed. Or affirmative action is racist. Here's another one uh, that is offensive to these losers. Everyone can succeed in this society if they work hard enough. That's considered offensive. You like this? The newly forbidden items were initially identified in a 2007 American psychological publication by Columbia University psychology and education professor Derald Wind Sue. You can see the picture of this moron uh, on michaelsavage.com. I had to look for the picture. Oh, he knows how to put on a tie. They taught him how to put a tie on and a white shirt. He looks very intelligent. But take a look at the, 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 the offal that these people are coming up with. And now that's become a training primer for incoming faculty at schools uh, around the nation. Not a lot to say things like that. And this is what Obama has wrought. This is what the left-wing sorority has uh, brought to America. They say statements may seem innocent, but they underhandedly and subtly undermine the very real experience with racism, sexism, and other forms of oppression, said Oi Yan Poon, assistant professor of education at Loyola University in Chicago. Can you see the kind of crap that the universities are being funded to, to research? They're called microaggressions if you say that hard work will, will help you succeed. Dr. Sue, what a moron, said this topic is a very complicated and controversial issue. And in order to understand offensive statements such as America is the land of opportunity, it's not really understood from the perspective of a minority American citizen. You mean the minority American citizen who's an idiot and can't get anywhere because he's an idiot, not because he's a minority. Because there have been quite a few minorities who've gotten somewhere, including the minorities who created this garbage. I mean, think about it. All this garbage was created by minorities. So where's the microaggression in that? And by the way, isn't Obama a minority? Isn't our attorney general a minority? What do you mean? They got there because of microaggression or because they used ma major aggression, macroaggression to get where they are by, by scaring people that they'd sue them or they'd look at them the wrong way. Please fight back. Stand up to these these gangsters. I have a list of examples of microaggression from this idiot that doesn't belong in America, belongs in communist Russia, communist China, the ex-Soviet Union. Even they couldn't come up with this. But take a look at what this is. Here's an example of microaggression to these gangsters. One, where are you from or where were you born? The message is you're not a true American. Or if you say you speak English very well, that insults them. Um, a person asking an Asian American or Latino American to teach them words in their native language, that's considered a microaggression. So in other words, if you say to a guy, how do you say El Camino de, de, de la Vida in Spanish? What does it mean? That's racism. In other words, if you try to communicate with a person of another race or language, you're now a racist. Here's one. You are a credit to your race. That's, that's no, uh, not allowed anymore. Wow, how did you become so good in math? Or if you say to an Asian person, you must be good in math. Can you help me with this problem? That's considered microaggression to these losers. Uh, when I look at you, I don't see color. That's considered uh, a bad thing to say. Or if you say this, there's only one race, the human race. That's a microaggression. Or if you say America is a melting pot, you've committed a crime. See, uh, a white man or woman clutches his or her purse or checks a wallet as a black or Latino person approaches. <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> <laughs> a store owner following a customer of color around the store. Wait a minute. How about a store owner following a young white boy around the store when the store owner is a minority? Because it happened to my son when there was a Korean grocer who every time he went in to buy a candy bar, she, she trailed him around the store. Was that a microaggression? I guess not. Someone crosses to the other side of the street to avoid a person of color. Well, let's see. You're walking alone at night and there's five people of color in gang outfits. Would you go up to them and say, hi guys, how you doing? Or would you cross the street? Uh, let me ask you that question, Professor. While walking through the halls of the chemistry building, a professor approaches a postdoc student of color, of color to ask if she or he is lost, making the assumption that the person is trying to break into one of the labs. You know, these people are suffering medical, a medical, I mean, they are suffering a, a, a serious psychosis here. You get the picture. 
Now, here's one of the worst things you can believe that these losers are saying symbolizes microaggression against minorities. One, I believe the most qualified person should get the job. That's offensive. Or men and women have equal opportunities for achievement. That's offensive. Or gender plays no part in who we hire. That's offensive. Or America is the land of opportunity. That's offensive. Or everyone can succeed in this society if they work hard enough. That's offensive to these idiots. You know, if I had the power, I have a solution to this problem. You're lucky I don't have the power. I only have a microphone. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. This is Michael Savage with uh, as much macroaggression as you can possibly tolerate in any three-hour span. I suppose that uh, any minority listening to the show would find it more than microaggression to talk about my love for America and that uh, if you work hard enough, you can succeed or that America is the land of opportunity. And I suppose if you don't like it, you can always listen to national uh, provincial radio funded by Barack Obama because it supports everything that he stands for, which is everything I don't stand for. Phone number here is irrelevant because the show is just about over. We have a minute left before this great holiday celebrating our independence from Britain. And it makes you wonder what it's all about, doesn't it? What was the War of Independence about? What was World War II about? Is this what was fought for and died for? That we could bring people like this into America who would trample the flag, set the flag on fire, attack the people who built the nation? Is that what the men died for? Is that what the crosses and all the war cemeteries stand for? That's what your ancestors died for? To let people in who say, please, please, I only want a fair chance. And before you know it, they're burning your flag and telling you you have no place in your own country. Not only get to the back of the bus, but get off the bus. That's what your grandfather died for, huh? That's what he stormed the beaches of Normandy for. Okay, I've said it like it is. And I'll continue to do so with God's will and your listenership. Thanks for listening.